Today we're going to expose the secret ideas behind building a better hot throw. If you're newer to candle making, hot throw just describes the strength of a candle as it burns, but creating a strong hot throw is so hard it seems like there must be some secret the rest of us don't know. So today's episode is going to be hyper focused on exposing how that all works so that you can design better candles. Let's dive in. Hello, my name is Kevin from Armitage Candle Company, the premier online resource for accelerating your candle making technique and business. In today's episode, we're gonna cover five ideas about hot throw that you can incorporate into your process and your design so that you can build a better candle. Now, starting out, it's important to call out that with candles, cold throw sells and hot throw keeps your customers coming back. Right, everybody opens up the candle, first thing they can do is smell it. But in order to come back and want to buy another candle after they're burning it, they say, wow, that was a great experience. Your candle smelled so dang good. And then they come back to you for more. So getting to the point where that is the reality is obviously desirable. And the thing is with hot throw and how elusive it seems, if we can understand it, then maybe, just maybe, we can improve it. So the first idea is that you don't need a wick to have a good hot throw. What do I mean by that? Well, as candle makers, we know that picking out the right wick is key to building a good hot throw. Like you don't get a good scent throw if your wick is wrong. It's either unsafe or it's imbalanced or whatever, whatever, whatever. There's so many ways to build a bad candle. But there's another half to the industry that we're all ignoring and that's wax melts and tarts. And they don't have a wick. They're literally just a cube of wax and fragrance. And you put it in a warmer and you melt it and it smells great. There's no wick involved at all. So what's going on here? The key takeaway from that is that that's evidence that the melt pool is a big contributor towards scent throw. Because really, that's, that's all those warmers have going for them. They create a melt pool. There's nothing wicked or thrown about it. It's literally just a melt pool. So... Idea number one is you don't need a wick because you have a melt pool. Which leads me to idea number two, which is that candles are a system. When I say system, I'm saying that they're a collection of different components that all work together to create that beautiful aroma we all know and love. And one of those components is the melt pool. And we know that that plays a role. But why is it that even if we get a full melt pool or we have a very melted candle that it's not, we can't smell it at all. I'm sure we've all made candles that way or had candles that do that. Well, it's because there's more going on to the aroma than just the melt pool. Wax melts don't have to worry about some of the other parts, but candles are an entire system. The other parts of the system are the flame, the wick, the melt pool, the container. And as you'll see, there's an ambient part to all of this as well. Now here's the big takeaway about the system. The system of the candle needs to regulate the melt pool temperature. Now this isn't something they teach you in Candle Making 101, but the temperature of that melt pool makes a huge difference about whether or not it's gonna throw well or not. And so when that melt pool hits that sweet spot, mm, that aroma is gonna get right into the air, it's gonna throw and you're just gonna love it so much. Fragrance is like Goldilocks. If there's too much heat, those top notes, those lighter notes, they're gonna evaporate or vaporize before they have a chance to throw. But if the porridge is too cold, if there's not enough heat, then the melt pool won't release enough of those aromatic compounds. So now let's talk about idea number three, and that is that wicking is stupidly hard. Well, here's the deal. The wick plays a huge role in the candle. When you have a wax melt, it's fairly straightforward. You put the wax melt into the warmer and you turn it on. It's very binary, on or off. But in a candle, in a complete system like that, you have a wick that is responsible not only for providing fuel to the flame, but also making sure that flame is not too hot and it keeps the melt pool at the perfect porridge temperature. Did I say porridge? I meant melt pool temperature. And on top of all that, the wick also has to balance combustion. That balance of wick fuel, flame temperature, and oxygen that's feeding into it. It's all so much responsibility. And the wick really is the single point of failure for a lot of bad candles. So what's happening? Well, that flame that's on the top of the wick is stirring up the air around it, 
creating this convection, these currents, these air currents that are all moving around right localized to the candle. And if you hit the sweet spot, if you're starting to move those air currents and you have to also have a melt pool that's at the right temperature, it's releasing those aromatic compounds into the air and it hits that air current kind of like a roller coaster and boom, it's out into the room. That's your scent throw. So how does throw actually happen with candles? Well, I'll do my best to explain it here. When the flame on the wick is hot enough and it doesn't take much, it'll start to stir up the local air currents. And those air currents get excited. And when the melt pool below it hits that sweet spot temperature where it starts to release compounds, those compounds will move up into the area where the flame is moving that air around and it'll just throw it all out into the room. Well, assuming that the room has decent air current flow in it as well. So at the microscopic layer, this wax blend is being thrown into the air. And the wax type makes a huge difference with how well it's going to throw. Now, think about it like this. If you tried to throw a boulder across your lawn, you wouldn't get very far. But if you try to throw a golf ball, you'll throw it a lot farther. In both cases, you're the one throwing the thing. And in this case, the wick system is throwing that wax. And heavier waxes aren't going to throw as easily as lighter waxes. This is exactly why paraffin seems to throw so well compared to soy candles because paraffin is less dense, it's lighter. If you haven't watched that video on specific gravity, that's where I go into explaining how we know that paraffin is lighter than soy generally. But that's what's going on here is that soy is dense, it's heavier, so like when it finally gets into the air and it's thrown, if you can get to that point, it probably won't go as far. It's, it's dense, it'll fall to the whatever, the ground, I guess, a little bit faster than paraffin, which will potentially go out a lot farther. And so this is why choosing your wick is so stupidly hard because it plays so many roles in the candle, in the system, and there's so many ways for it to screw up, which leads to idea number four, which is that more fragrance is not the answer. More fragrance is not the answer. A lot of candle makers want to just add more fragrance oil when they can't smell their candle and pro candle makers will tell you, hey, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't do that. Just wait. You might want less fragrance oil. Well, fragrance oil impacts the burn so much and we've talked about this all the time. We talk about this in terms of testing. We've talked about this in terms of safety. And the deal is that we need to understand one very key thing about this. Fragrance oil is the source and the fuel of the aroma, but the candle system is what delivers that aroma to the room, right? Adding more fuel doesn't mean you're going to automatically make the delivery system more efficient. It's important to understand that because fragrance oil, it doesn't take much to actually smell that. I mean, if you get a little bit on your finger or on a surface, you can smell it for quite a while. It's strong. Right? And if you make a wax melt out of it, you know that it doesn't take that much to do it. Now, a lot of people will boost their wax melts by adding a lot of fragrance oil because you kind of can. You don't have to worry about a wicking system. It's a little bit easier, but it doesn't necessarily equate to a stronger throw if you add more fragrance. In fact, if you add too much fragrance oil, you could impact the way that that flame burns and potentially adding too much could make that flame burn way too hot. Why is too hot too bad? Because if those aroma chemicals get up into the air, but your flame is too hot, it'll vaporize those top notes and all you'll be left with is a weird smelling, not very good candle because the only thing left that could survive your onslaught of heat was like the base notes that really are not intended to live by themselves sometimes. So just remember, fragrance oil is the fuel, but the candle is the delivery system for that. And probably the most important concept of all of this is that you need a good airflow in the room you're burning the candle in. Too stagnant, and it won't matter how well your candle throws that if it can't pick up into some local air current. Now there's a lot that we can't see going on around us with air currents, but you'll know that sometimes it just ma matters if you move your candle to a different area of the room, all of a sudden you can smell it a lot better. And that's because your room is not set up to transition air from that previous place to where you are. After hearing all this, I want you to remember just this one thing, if you forget everything else that we're talking about today, and that's this. Optimal hot throw comes from a balance of fragrance load, melt pool temperature, ambient air conditions, container design, 
and wax blend. It's a balance. Everything added to a candle impacts everything added. Remember that. It's super important because it's just adding more fragrance oil. That's only one key of the whole equation. And often adding more causes issues in other areas. It's all a balancing act. And I know you can do it. It just takes time. It takes testing and it takes determination. Let's talk about warmers for a quick second here too. Fragrance oil does deteriorate over time. Now, when you have a wax melt and you place it in a warmer, that warmer, most warmers are either on or off. Some of them do have a variable setting, but they're on or off. If that warmer runs really hot, it could be bad for your wax blend because too hot of a temperature will deteriorate the entire blend, no matter what the fragrance oil is. And you may lose the quality of that fragrance over time. And you may turn that warmer on and get nothing out of it, even if last time it smelled great after you did it. And that's because extended exposure to that high heat of that bulb could deteriorate the fragrance and you just gotta swap out that wax. But that goes to my point of saying that like heat is super important for balancing the way that the fragrance oil plays well with the way that it throws. You have too much heat, it'll burn out those top notes, not enough heat, and you won't be able to release those aromas into the air. And all this leads into my final fifth secret idea, and that's about curing. Curing, curing, curing. I talk about it all the time. There's a video here if you want to go see that, but here's the deal about curing. One of the biggest things that I see people doing all the time is that they burn their candle after it really hasn't cured enough, and they say, I got a great hot throw. I'm done. I did it. But what they may accidentally be missing is that curing not only handles the fragrance part, but it handles the hardness of that wax. The hardness of that wax determines how much thermal energy it takes to melt that wax. So if you have a soy wax candle, for example, and you burn it 24 hours after and it works great, even if you get a hot throw, if that candle hasn't substantially hardened, it could throw off the entire balance of the system. Even if it works on one day, it may not work on a later day when the candle has hardened up a little bit. Okay, <laughs> so that's five ideas about hot throw that I want you to take away. Now, it's not a secret guide. It's not going to tell you how to exactly design a perfect candle, but it should help you understand the concepts that all play into why candles don't work so that when you may run into issues or you're thinking about how do I want to do this, you have the tools and the equipment to make decisions and pivot according to what you see in the performance of your candle. So one additional metric to add to your record book is this, melt pool temperature. And it's going to depend on the wax blend and the fragrance oil and the container that you do it in. And so I can't tell you what the perfect one is, but if you're working through a small iteration on a single candle design with hyper focus, then knowing the right melt pool temperature for that design will help you understand what's going well and what isn't going well. Anyways, I hope you found this useful. If you did, give me a like. I wouldn't mind that. If you have any questions about hot throw or if you have any conversation points that we can all kind of lock on to, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear that. Otherwise, I hope you have a great week. I hope you make beautiful candles and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.